So, why 1939? Why not 1938? 37. Go back to King Kong. Buster Keaton? Wings. The Iron Horse. The Great Train Robbery. Well, this is my new series, Lessons from Action History. And these need to be applicable lessons. You can learn a hell of a lot from the silent era and from much of the 30s, but I needed a moment, a specific time that makes my point. The craft long before what we see today not only influenced where we are now, but arguably we haven't really evolved too much from. And I thought to myself, as I enjoyed this year of incredible output, aren't these lessons applicable? Isn't there something that still merits study not only in a general way, but for action filmmakers, and also for action fans who want to see what older films have to offer that resonates today, technically and narratively? Run, Luke, run. I've always looked to the classics myself, but I never really explored them in this way, and rarely on this channel. I recently made a short film that you'll be able to see at the end of this series, and I apply techniques there that pulled from the eras I'm going to explore with you for the duration of this series. And I was really happy with how it turned out. But enough of that. The influence of The Wizard of Oz cannot be understated. It is referenced in obvious ways, and yet also its very existence as possibly one of the first purely money-making cinema ventures at this scale to find relative success at the time paved the way for the blockbuster. Follow the yellow brick road. But its influence appears elsewhere too. The Wizard of Oz is ostensibly about one thing. His family. Yes, this misfit family coming together is sort of the template for the ensemble action-adventure film, and it isn't the only one to release in 1939, but we'll get to that. It's far, far away. It is a simple film with a simple structure. A person finds themselves in a strange land. They meet some strange people and build trust as they head together to a green place. Once there, they go back on themselves, and am I talking about The Wizard of Oz or Fury Road? Now, obviously one is a little more complex than the other, but the basic structure is there. We're going to the green place of many mothers. Now, the idea of monomyths, heroes' journeys, of the fact that perhaps only a very few story structures actually exist is not new, but aren't often the best action films well. Simple. The basic rhythm of The Wizard of Oz is this. Two steps forward, one step back. The same as in every great action film. Every success is met with a small defeat. Each time they gain, they lose a little, but learn in the process. Why are you doing this? We are good. Essentially, our characters overcome obstacles. Simple. They celebrate that. before being hit with another greater obstacle. How about a little fire, Scarecrow? Oh. Dorothy arrives in Oz alone. She is made to feel better about that, and we get our first action scene. Yep, a musical number choreographed carefully with lots of color and movement. No different, save for the lack of violence, than the effort that would go into an action set piece. Through The Matrix, we realize that it's not just a bunch of moves put together, like, it's dance. It is literally dance. It's not about what works or what's cooler or tougher. It's like, how do you make it aesthetically pleasing and tell the story with it? An evil witch scares her, but she gains the ruby slippers. She goes off alone, nervous, but meets Scarecrow. After this, we get another action scene and a feeling of success. Won't you take me with you? Why, of course I will. But now we get the witch and the mean trees. We meet the Tin Man, and the team grows. Now, the witch arrives to threaten them directly. Or I'll stuff a mattress with you! Another successful action scene. And so on. At the point they reach their zenith of understanding as a group, 
their relationship at its strongest point, they are separated. Now, what is the structure of Predator? In a way, it's the Wizard of Oz forward, but in reverse. Dropped into a strange land, like Dorothy, Dutch loses his team one by one, rather than meeting them. But in each death, he gains an understanding of the menace no! and the world around him, just as Dorothy learns about Oz and herself. Then why didn't you tell her before? Because she wouldn't have believed me. She had to learn it for herself. Whenever you want to have your characters move forward, you stop them. You punish them even. Knock them back at every turn. Your characters will get stronger as they go. And if you need to up the peril, just throw in some faceless drone enemies to raise the stakes for a moment. I've always loved this quote from Craig Mazin, the writer of The Last of Us, Chernobyl, and numerous successful comedy films, from his fantastic script notes episode, How to Write a Movie. Don't just stab your characters, twist the knife in them. If someone has to face a fear, make it overwhelming to them. Don't disappoint them, punish them. Make your characters lower their defenses by convincing them that everything's gonna be okay, and then punch them right in the face, metaphorically. Of course, Dorothy has learned through her trials and tribulations, across every scary obstacle in this weird world, that one truth. There's no place like home. Wizard of Oz might not be an action film, but the rhythms of its structure, its set-piece musical numbers, even the MacGuffins... The broom. May we have it? Please, and take it with you! It's all the basis for what would become blockbuster action adventure. Hell, the director who took over the film from George Cukor, Victor Fleming, was known as a director of action pictures and a man-movie director. In the same year, Fleming handled the more action-heavy work on Gone with the Wind, taking them from Cukor again. Maybe, instead of constantly looking at what seemed to work, the iconography, the characters, the nostalgia, Try looking at why those things work so well, why they endure, and apply them to something new. Hold it! Whoa, steady, ho, ho. Hey, look, it's Ringo! And applying new ideas to something at the time considered box office poison is exactly what John Ford did with the Western and Stagecoach. Stagecoach was the first of what they called the adult westerns, or the psychological westerns. It took certain cliched characters, like the drunken doctor, the hooker with the heart of gold, the uh, unscrupulous banker, the good bad man, the um, gentleman with a dubious past, and mixed it into this unusually subversive recipe. I'll take the Winchester. You may need me in this Winchester, Curly. You don't understand, kid. You're under arrest. These people do not like each other. None of them really trust each other. And yet all will be given space to grow and to trust in the face of enormous peril. Much has been written about Stagecoach in this manner, so I'm not going to rehash that. No, what I want to talk about are these. People? No. Ceilings. And if you look, you'll see ceiling pieces in Stagecoach, which people have said that Orson invented ceiling pieces. Well, Ford had it long before Orson. And this? The Stagecoach? Well, yes, but what it's in? Nothingness. And because of that, immense peril. How do you create tension outside of your characters hating one another, outside of a race against time, outside of just the fear of death? Through setting. This might be a pressure cooker of a film, but the characters always inhabit pressure cooker environments. Stand guard over there. Whether it's just a seemingly normal room, the ceiling appears to bear down on them. Now tell me to move over, sir. The stagecoach itself is also, of course, a small, 
tight space with all of these characters squeezed in beside each other. Put off that cigar. And outside, there is nothing. It's a terrifying contrast. Action films are tension. We know the Indians are coming, but when and from where? This desert is a sea. The stagecoach is akin to Hitchcock's titular lifeboat. The spaces are either too tight or too vast, but never in between. And if you want to make it worse, throw a baby in the mix. If you think that baby isn't going to get hurt, remember John Ford is the director who, unbeknownst to its mother, who has told a far safer story, put an actual baby in the path of an actual stampede of horses. This is an action film, but it builds to the action. Ford builds. You must warn your passengers that they travel at their own risk. And builds. You mean to say there are no troops at this station? Ain't no soldiers here but what you see. And builds. Ford didn't even particularly like violence, saying as much in multiple interviews. And my pictures do not always show violence. Very, very few of them do. And if they do show violence, it's over very quickly. Don't shoot. Please don't shoot. I suggested more than anything else. I never show a long sequence I mean with violence. I do it quickly or I do it by suggestion. It is telling that for a film so often noted as maybe the first truly defining action film, doesn't have any action for quite a long time. Tension can be enough to keep you gripped until the action kicks in. Your help. Thank, Thank you, sir. sir. When the action comes, we want to see the horror play out. We need to see what was so frightening. And they cannot have the tools to win at all, because that would deflate the tension. They have to be unable to escape. They have to be punished. Maybe not as far as their horse is being shot, but then as John Ford said, there'd be no movie. So we are given the final climax, the cathartic, deserved win. The film cannot end with the stagecoach attack. It has to end here. And yet, with one more moment of tension. Is Stagecoach the defining action-adventure film for me of 1939? No. There is another. So that next film is Gunga Dean. And I will say here how of course dated it is in its representation of various themes, ideals and characters. One thing to note throughout this series is that outdated views and themes will be present in some of the films I cover. I personally do not believe that should exclude any film from study or even enjoyment within reason. It is hard not to see the DNA of Gunga Dean throughout Hollywood, especially in its literal iconography. This, and to a lesser extent The Stranglers of Bombay, all but makes up half of what you see in Temple of Doom, at least in terms of the villainous peril. But it goes deeper than that. To me, Gunga Dean is one of the best examples of this action form existing since at least 1939. Good work, soldier! I'm gonna focus on a particular sequence, relatively early on in the film, that for me is as exciting and fresh feeling as anything you see in cinema today, bearing in mind the comparative roughness of some of the craft. 
First of all, this is a template action adventure. We begin by seeing the menace, here the thuggy cult, introducing the stakes. Then, we're introduced to those we must trust to take on this villainous force. In one of my personal favourite character introductions ever. What do you want? Where's Sergeant Valentine? That just says everything you need to know. Here! Where's Sergeant Cutter? About our merry band. He's busy. As our soldiers reach this village that has fallen silent in communication, tensions begin to rise. Why? Because we know what is happening, even if our characters don't. Four people are sitting around a table, talking about baseball, whatever you like. Five minutes of it, very dull. Suddenly, a bomb goes up, blows the people to smithereens. What do the audience have? Ten seconds of shock. Now take the same scene and tell the audience there is a bomb under that table and will go off in five minutes. Well, the whole emotion of the audience is totally different because you've given them that information. I guess there's nothing, Major. Kali! Kali! What surprises me now is just how this is constructed. The geography is for the most part clarified very well indeed. The action might have a vintage brawl feel, but in terms of composition and timing of moves, this isn't far off what we see today. And of course, there is suspense to every moment, even in a sequence as thrillingly adventurous as this. Once they get shelter, we immediately see a villain hiding, waiting to attack. But if there is one thing that I love in this scene that certainly reflects action today, it is the use of humor in the set pieces. I just remember being taken away by the, the humor in it and the sort of uh, sense of joy there was to it, even though it was an adventure. Die Hard has some of that oh, energy definitely. in it. It's a funny movie, but never to the point where you don't feel the menace. It feels like real menace, just like Raiders feels like real menace. <laughs> the dynamite here becomes a way for our heroes to get a leg up on the villains for a while. Again, it's two steps forward, one step back, literally. What happens to Douglas Fairbanks Jr. here puts him in dire peril of his own making. The humor has now become the tension, and it builds and builds, going back and forth, a literal ticking bomb of comedy action, until one of my favorite action punchlines. The great screenwriter, William Goldman, considered this the best film of all time and said only an idiot or critic would argue that point. You can even see its influence on him directly in what happens as this scene ends. What's the matter with you? I can't swim. <laughs> oh, 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 shit! This series is about how these pictures still exist, and so not to forget that they aren't just stories, but craft. The economy of the writing, the blocking of the scenes, the interrogation of how every sequence is set up to maximize the background tension. It is worthy of study now, more than ever. And of course, from 1939, that long dormant genre that Ford had helped resurrect, it would take over for a very long time and have an impact on action cinema that arguably is unparalleled. See you next week.